intensity exercise that will cause my body to adapt, but won't put it into that inflamed, stressful state. And you also have to pepper in some lower intensity work. So this is your... Flexibility. Mm -hmm. So that you have recovery, you're getting uh, blood flow circulating, you're tapping into some mitochondrial work so that you are still getting benefit of exercise, but it's not in that modern intensity. So that's what we mean by polarizing. So if we were to talk in like the zone talk that everyone talks is out there, right? We're looking what at is zones. So if we're talking about heart rate and the way that your body works, we have zone one, which is just sitting around. You know, like you're, yeah. We're in zone one. We're right in now. zone right one. Zone two is the bro science kind of thing where you're like, let's let's work in this zone two area where we're working. I was walking. in zone two when you're talking about menstrual cycle. Okay, yeah, exactly. there you go. That's it. A little elevated. Your, your heart rate's elevated. You still a little bit have a conversation. Um, for women, it's good for recovery, stress release. For men, it's good to improve metabolic flexibility. We're looking at zone three, four. That's the area you want to stay out of unless you're specifically training for something that requires you to be there. So that would be your half marathons, your endurance races, that kind of stuff. Everyone wants to stay out of zone three, four. And during training. Oh, okay. Yeah, during Fine. training. Because that's the medium range, right? Yeah, that's medium range. So you want to jump into zone five, hang around for five, six. Yeah. Okay, a couple of minutes and then get out of there. Yeah. But in a week, this is what, yeah, it's let's just be week. clear. So two to four days a week, you should be lifting progressively to lift heavy, meaning um, heavier weights, fewer reps, yeah. right? One compound lift a day, plus the augmentative lifts that go behind it, right? Mm -hmm. So you're warming up first, then you're going to do one lift, and then you're going to do your jumping or your balance work. The other days of the week you will do preferably low intensity doing anything. Walking briskly down the New York street could count as that. It's it's continuous motion. And then a couple days a week, add in your sprint intervals, your really high zone five, six, high intensity. And then when you've got that, you can add in your four by four VO2 max on one of the other days, because it sounds like a lot, but when I work with non-pro athletes, I layer on behaviors. Absolutely. Because if I say all of this at yeah. once, yeah. nobody's going to do anything. Mm -mm. I always describe it as we have these pillars, right? First, we have to nail sleep. Doesn't matter who you are. You have to because you cannot. It's non negotiable. Yeah. You cannot invoke any kind of metabolic or body composition change without adequate sleep. Also improves stress resilience. Then we look at nutrition and physical activity. The behaviors that go with both of those are somewhat independent. You have some people that are more motivated to do physical activity and some people who are more motivated to change nutritional habits. Most of the time, there are two different personalities. So we have to look at what comes next. And then we also have, which isn't lesser importance, but often neglected, is the mindfulness and community. So this is being out in nature. It's connecting with friends. It might be going to a group exercise class. It might be just having coffee. But that is really, really important for parasympathetic and whole, like, whole being. Stress life. response. Exactly. So there's a new book out, um, coming out, called Joy Span. I don't know if you've spoken with her. So mm -hmm. she's a gerontologist and works with the very elderly. And she has a very specific... You know, what determines who's going to kill it in that last decade of life? Mm -hmm. And that community part, using your brain, you know, having interactions with human beings seems to be the key. And if you don't keep that going through this 40s, 50s, 60s, when you get to 70 and 80, you're not going to have a great end of your life. And what about the last phase then? So if someone's post-menopausal, mm -hmm. does their exercise recommendations change at all? We like to start the habits early and continue them through. If you haven't started, it's not too late. As we're seeing like with Liftmore and some other of the older age research that's coming out, it's never too late to start. We just have to be very careful of how you start to have support and phase you in to these different Winning. exercise mo modalities. Is it the same exercises though? Meaning? You know, the three days a week, the mobility, the strength. The I am firmly postmenopausal. And I am doing all these things. But it's different. Different People always ask me, what does heavy lifting mean? Right. It's and relative. It's relative. My heavy 
is not going to be Stacy's heavy, or I should say it the other way. Stacy's very heavy is not going to be my heavy. In Livemore, they just the authors describe the one the one rep max, and so one rep max is like safely. What is the heaviest you can do one rep? You know, so for a bicep curl, what is the heaviest weight I can do one to fail? You know, to, I'm going to fail after this one. And for me, that was about 20 pounds with good form. Exactly, safely with good form, and so. I could nail 20. And so then they took them down to about 70, 80% of that, um, which for me was about 15, 16 pounds. So that you can usually do about five reps before you hit failure. And that is what they consider lifting heavy. And that seemed to really resonate with my followers to understand what that Mm -hmm. meant. And there's so many women that underestimate their strength, Mm -hmm. see them and they gravitate towards the 10 pound dumbbells. It's like, put that away. Go to the next one, do a couple of lifts with that. And then ideally, I want you to put that away and pick up the next one because that's going to challenge you. Because women have been so conditioned to do 10 to 15 reps to get, quote, toned and not really put in the work they need to to build muscle and to get the benefit out of strength training. And I'm always telling women, you're underestimating yourself in so many facets. Don't cheat yourself with the strength training as well. Because people have to remember what we're what we're training for now. It's different than I had a woman recently say, I was taught to do biceps curls five pounds 30 times. Well, after 30 times, not only are you bored, but you'll probably be at failure 30 times. Mm-hmm. That will build endurance. I am training to be as strong as possible. And when I'm a, when I have strength down, then I start playing with tempo so mm-hmm. that I could build replace some of the explosive muscle fibers that I'm going to lose over time. To your point, Rhonda, yes. I am um, just been writing my book in Cape Town, as I, was, I told you before we started recording. Mm-hmm. And one of the studies that I read about while I was writing the book was a study done by some a guy called Hal Hirschfield and his colleagues, where they asked, they put people in these MRI scanners and they asked them to think about a famous celebrity. And then they asked them to think about themselves today. And then they asked them to think about themselves in 10 years time. And in 10 years' time, the same brain regions lit up as if they were thinking about the celebrity, hmm. which kind kind of led them to conclude that in our brain, we almost see our future selves as a bit of a stranger. Yes, that's right. Mm. And so when we think about long-term planning, this is in part why a lot of this advice is often most effective when it's put in the context of like short-term performance mm. or cognitive benefits, mm-hmm. because we really do struggle to like care about ourselves at 90. Yeah. And I, we I think we all kind of think we can just fi- I can figure it out later. And- I think what's different for women, especially in menopause, is because we're also taking care of our parents yep. in so many ways. You know, we're in this like raising kids, going through our own hormonal upheaval, and then watching our mothers, our grandmothers, our aunts age. And we the way society is set up, women become the caretakers of their parents, generally the oldest daughter. And I have to give full credit to my sister who lives in the same town as my mom and as a nurse. So she really is bearing the brunt of taking care of mama because I'm living this life. So thank you, Leah, if you're watching. It is such a tremendous stress, you know? And so our motivation, my sister and I, is like, yeah. we don't want to do this to our daughters. Yeah. Exactly. The other thing I want to bring in is the brain health component, right? We talk about Alzheimer's and dementia. And one of the reasons I really preface doing high intensity work is the lactate production, because we're finding more and more research coming out um, showing that part of the development of dementia and Alzheimer and the plaque is a misstep in brain metabolism. So when we're looking at brain metabolism and the brain uses a lot of glucose, it also uses lactate. Now, for women, we have less of the glycolytic or lactate-producing fibers, and we tend to lose those with age. Men are born with more, tend to hold on to them more, so it's not necessarily as big an issue for lactate production. Men need to spend more time in the low intensity being able to produce more of our fat-burning capacity. But for women, doing that high-intensity work and being able to produce lactate to then allow the heart and the brain to use that preferential fuel feeds forward to reducing the misstep in this brain metabolism component that occurs. And it's such a sex difference. We're seeing a a change in glucose metabolism in and around perimenopause into menopause. Mm. So it's that lactate production that I is kind of the offshoot of the high intensity work that's super important for brain health as so well as when you look at glucose metabolism in the brain, I'm talking specifically coming out of Arizona 
and and from Lisa Moscone's work, mm-hmm. and they looked at glucose utilization in the brain, especially the forebrain, through the transition. It's wildly different based on what phase of perimenopause, menopause, and postmenopause that they're in. And it's it's absolutely astounding. And, and they're seeing patterns that can give clues that may be the women who are headed towards the dementia route versus those who aren't. Mm-hmm. And women are significantly more likely than men to develop dementia and Alzheimer's, yeah. mm-hmm. largely because they have certain unique biological risk factors and also because they live longer. Um, and the sociocultural component. I keep bringing it up because yeah. I work. Stress. Yeah. But also, if we're looking at women who are 80, 90 years old now, their upbringing to this point is completely different than ours, meaning that the job availability and the brain stimulation they had when they were in their 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s, completely different than what we have now. Better or for worse. 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 So they didn't have necessarily the opportunity to be scientists, lawyers, medical doctors. So they didn't have as much stimulation of brain and, and implications on that neuroplasticity. So we're seeing a higher episodic issue of dementia and Alzheimer's in older women now because they didn't have the same lay down effect that we have now as 50 year olds, 40, 50 year olds and this and the stimulus we have for neuroplasticity. Oh, so I can- Like you're laying down brain pathways and neural fibers. So neuroplasticity- like, Just think about it like the know. bone, but so you're creating help. pathways in your brain to make you less, healthier, but more resilient to- More resilient. Uh, to dementia. Okay. Mm-hmm. But they're, but they're also gonna have Built stress, a stronger right? brain, younger. Are they not gonna have more stress? If they're working- Maybe. Maybe. So hours and- fascinating study, and this one shot me out of a cannon emotionally, was if you choose to become a caretaker of a parent with dementia, you have a 60% increased risk. Now, there's a genetic component, but when they took the genetics out of it, ju- and they feel like it's the stress of caregiving for that parent, mm-hmm. you are signing your own death warrant because now you are increasing your risk of death. Because Yeah, because I'm right in thinking that women are still both caregiver and now 